Sehr schönen guten Tag, liebe Seherinnen und Hörerinnen des YouTube-Kanals von International. Nach kurzer Zeit bereits das nächste Video. Hier spricht Fritz Edlinger. Dies ist nur ein kurzer Einleitungstext zu einem Video, das Sie sich dann äh, im Anschluss äh, genauer ansehen können. Es ist äh, der Mitschnitt eines äh, Webinars eines afghanischen Diplomaten und Politikwissenschaftlers, der vor zwei Tagen ähm, einen Vortrag gehalten hat zum Thema Neutrality and Vulnerable States in Analysis of Afghanistan's Permanent Neutrality. Wie Sie hören, ist auch der Vortrag dann in englischer Sprache. Er wurde gehalten vom äh, afghanischen Botschafter in der Schweiz und bei den Vereinten Nationen, Dr. Nasir Andisha. Es ist ein Vortrag, der schon länger geplant war, der natürlich durch die aktuellen Ereignisse eine neue Bedeutung bekommen hat. Dr. Nasir ist einer der afghanischen Politikwissenschaftler, die sich sehr intensiv mit dem Konzept der Neutralität befasst haben. Das ist auch der Kontakt, der dann äh, zu international ähm, geschlossen wurde. Er ist im engen Kontakt mit einem unserer ständigen Autoren, äh, Pascal Lothas, der ein Schweizer Politikwissenschaftler ist, der sich sehr intensiv mit den äh, Fragen von Neutralität und Neutralitätspolitik befasst und der auch schon zwei ähm, Artikel im International verfasst hat, darunter einen über die österreichische Neutralität in unserer vorvorletzten Ausgabe. Und äh, Pascal Lothas hat auch ein internationales Forschungsnetzwerk Neutrality Studies äh, ins Leben gerufen und im Rahmen dieses Netzwerkes ist nun der Vortrag äh, von Botschafter Nasir Andisha. Vielleicht noch dazu einige Bemerkungen, die auf die aktuelle Situation Bezug nehmen. Und da könnt, möchte ich kurz zitieren, auch aus dem Vortrag. Botschafter Andisha betont, dass nicht nur die alten geopolitischen Rivalitäten der Großmächte in und um Afghanistan immer noch dieselben sind, sondern dass nach wie vor die potenzielle Neutralität des Landes, darüber wurde schon öfters eben diskutiert und auch äh, korrespondiert und äh, Schriften verfasst, eine zentrale in der Konzeption einer neuen Außenpolitik Afghanistans äh, spielen können. Es wird sicherlich unter der von der Taliban beherrschten Regierung äh, eine neue Formulierung der afghanischen Außenpolitik geben und es ist auch für uns als Österreicher interessant, wenn hier Konzepte, Ideen, die in Richtung einer Blockfreiheit, einer Neutralität diskutiert werden. Und eben insofern ist ein Satz in, der, in dem Referat von Botschafter Antischer sehr interessant. Er sagt nämlich, eine reine Allianzpolitik im zukünftigen Afghanistan, im neuen Afghanistan, ist mit hoher Wahrscheinlichkeit nicht im Interesse der verschiedenen Taliban-Fraktionen und mit der Geschichte und Geografie des Landes auch nicht vereinbar. Das ist etwas, was wirklich interessant ist. Ich glaube, dass es daher auch sehr wichtig und interessant ist, den nachfolgenden Vortrag anzuhören, weil das Theorien, Thesen, Analysen sind, die in der aktuellen politischen Diskussion um Afghanistan eigentlich noch keine besondere Rolle spielen. Es werden in Wirklichkeit von wichtigen Spielern, wird in Wirklichkeit versucht, die traditionelle koloniale, neokoloniale Politik in Afghanistan weiter äh, fortzusetzen, indem man eben dann ähm, 
einzelne Parteien dort unterstützt, einzelne äh, Personen, wenn man sich äh, gerade in den letzten Tagen ansieht, die Diskussionen äh, dieses äh, Gefechtes im Banschirtal, ob man nicht äh, die Leute, die sich dort äh, verschanzt haben, unterstützen sollte. Das ist im Wesentlichen, wäre das schon eine äh, weitere Fortsetzung von westlicher, amerikanischer, britischer, französischer Einmischung in Afghanistan und äh, eigentlich sollte man inzwischen zur Kenntnis genommen haben, auch in Afghanistan und im Zusammenhalt mit Afghanistan, dass man sich einfach die traditionelle westliche imperiale Politik überlegen sollte, weil sie hat eigentlich im Orient nur Failed States, äh, viele Tote, unglaubliche Verletzungen und, und Vernichtungen von, von äh, Gütern und von Landschaften mit sich gebracht. Insofern darf ich diesen Vortrag wirklich ankündigen. Ich darf empfehlen, dass äh, die üblichen Seherinnen und Hörerinnen von äh, YouTube auf international sich das ansehen. Es ist sicherlich eine Erneuerung, eine Erweiterung der aktuellen Diskussion um Afghanistan, denn die wird uns sicherlich nicht erspart bleiben. In diesem Sinn nochmals herzlichen Dank für das Interesse an unserem Kanal. Ich bedanke mich bei der Gelegenheit auch nochmals für die zahlreichen neuen Abonnentinnen und Abonnenten im Laufe der letzten ein, zwei Wochen. Wir werden sehr bald schon wiederum weitere Videos veröffentlichen und ich freue mich über jeden Kommentar und ich freue mich über jedes neue Abo, denn das bestätigt, dass wir nicht ganz auf dem Holzweg sind mit unserer Politik. In dem Sinn herzlichen Dank und ich hoffe auf ein interessantes Gespräch und auf einen interessanten Vortrag des afghanischen Botschafters. Dankeschön. Hello. So we just had with us this afternoon Ambassador Nasir A. Andisha, who last year published a wonderful book with the title Neutrality and Vulnerable States, an analysis of Afghanistan's permanent neutrality, in which the ambassador explores the last 150 years of Afghanistan's history of neutrality and their options for it to become again the foreign policy of Afghanistan in this very different environment. Today, not even three weeks after the fall of the Ghani government and the takeover of the Taliban of Kabul, um, the foreign policy of the new Afghanistan is anyone's guess. Few people are as suited, though, to give us insights um, than Ambassador uh, Andisha is. He studied Uh, Euro, uh, in Europe and the United States. He got his PhD from uh, the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy at the Australian National University. He served as a director of multilateral economic relations and international financial institutions. He then was appointed ambassador in 2011, serving in Australia, New Zealand and the Republic of Fiji. Later, he became the deputy foreign minister for management and uh, resources at his uh, home of, in his home of Afghanistan. He is currently the ambassador and permanent representative of Afghanistan to the United Nations in Geneva. Please enjoy his talk. Thank you very much, Pascal. Thanks for your kind introduction and, and, and thanks for organizing uh, this, uh, this session. I understand that, you know, we were planning for, for something else, perhaps for something more academic, but, uh, but again, you know, uh, as in students of, of international relations and to that matter of neutrality, I see that, you know, we have many uh, experts and researchers here. So, so I should perhaps, you know, shift gear more towards, uh, you know, current affairs and, and why and how, you know, neutrality is still important, still relevant, in the vulnerable states and the smaller states. And I think that is something that everyone who knows about the literature of neutrality uh, knows. So I also uh, send my greetings uh, to everyone in, the, in, this, in this webinar and all over the world. Good morning, good afternoon to all of you. And thank you for, 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 for joining um, this, uh, this, this session. Uh, the, when, you know, when Pascal reached out uh, to me, 
uh, from Japan, um, I was really, you know, uh, interested in, in to find out. That's that's my bet. That's my problem because, you know, as somebody interested in this area, I should have really find out that there is a circle of study of neutrality. Uh, although I know a number of names here because I, I quoted them in my, my research. They, I know there is uh, a very uh, a good group of researchers, but I didn't know about what you know uh, initiative Pascal is doing. And I'm hoping that from now on I could be you know a small member of this circle and could continue uh, whatever comes next in my personal uh, career or my uh, professional career and also in my country uh, to to really learn from you and to interact from you in this in this very important but niche area of international relations and security policies. Uh, to us, uh, in Afghanistan, neutrality uh, comes uh, kind of natural. It is uh, when I was, uh, you know, from the time, from the very young age, when I was studying uh, uh, history of Afghanistan, when I was doing some research on, on international relations about Afghanistan, I already, always uh, uh, faced I always encountered with two very important expressions, elements in the foreign policy of Afghanistan. One constant was neutrality, different forms of it, from buffer states, which was the creation of the modern Afghanistan uh, in, in, you know, in, in around 1885 and then 89, when you know, the whole uh, Karen borders of Afghanistan was formalized with, you know, between the king of Afghanistan and Sir. Uh, Martin Durant, who is Mortimer Durant, uh, who was the British Foreign Secretary at the time, Indian uh, uh, Foreign Secretary. So from that time, the whole geography of Afghanistan uh, came into being as a buffer geography. And then naturally, normally, it's you know moved from a buffer state into you know into a neutral. And there is also lots of literature that 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 when a, you know a buffer system disappears. Uh, the uh, state, above our state, uh, uh, normally uh, uh, tend to, to become a neutral state. Uh, and then this neutrality, of course, moved on to become uh, non-alignment. Because as a state, as a country, we had different identities, uh, competing identities, to make it a, nas a nation state. Because before um, 80, uh, 1893, we were part of an empire. And that time there was no question of nation states. So that empire could sometimes be in Iran, sometimes in Central Asia, many times in Kabul and Ghazni, in Kandahar. But then the question of nation state, when it comes that nation state has to have, you know, some, some sort of uh, identity. If one identity was, okay, who are the people? But then it's, this current geography is a mix of people. There's no one people. Uh, but then, you know, the other identity was that this is a place where, you know, it's a corridor of all this uh, civilization. But then it was overlapping. It was the, uh, the, the uh, sort of, you know, South Asian Indian civilization. And then there was Central Asian one, there's the Turkic one, this is the Persian one. So I think neutrality or being in a state where you can stay focused on yourself and try to create a balance relationship, the right balance between your major neighbors, which not always was, uh, uh, you know, at least in the contemporary history, British India and Tsarist Russia defined this piece of land as, you know, it was part of our uh, political identity and geopolitical identity. But then 1947 and, you know, independent of uh, subcontinent uh, was also, you know, a shake up to our uh, question of identity. And again, this was when that, you know, the first world war, we were neutral, neutral in the sense of you all of, you know, that the legal sense of the 1907, uh, the Hague Convention of Neutrality. Uh, we stayed, we remained neutral, of course, with the help of uh, British, because otherwise we could have not been neutral. That's a kind of, you know, a, a, a basically a counterfactual uh, question that whether if, Britain and the, uh, Russia was not on the same on the same side of the of, uh, world war. Whether Afghanistan could have stayed neutral or not, that was you know a very interesting thing. My answer is no. It was not impossible because both both countries decided and agreed for Afghanistan to be neutral. Second world war, we were again neutral, and then after after the 1947, so we had these two competing. Uh, 
uh, ideas, which uh, I mentioned one of them, neutrality. The other was sort of, you know, the, the emancipation of Pashtun lands south of the Iran line. That also defined the idea of Pashtunistan. Also, to some extent, was used by you know, some of our rulers as you know, the defining character of this state to, you know, to, to, to create, to make sort of a national unity, which of course brought us a lot of problems even till now. So fast forward today, Taliban entering to Afghanistan via Pakistan, and they could tolerate their safe havens in the past 20 years, despite all the international efforts can, can, can take you back to 1947 and to this uh, creation of Pakistan and to the identity conflict between what was you know, the lands of Afghans, which is comprised of you know, Afghan Pashtuns and non-Pashtuns. But then the majority of that nation, Pashtun nation, remained on the other side of, of, of that Duran line, for which uh, neither United Nations nor you know, uh, regional efforts, nothing could solve it. And somehow, you know, part of this legacy, it stayed on the other side and now consolidated there. And instead of we having a claim on the other side as the Pakistanis <laughs> and the, you know, even Taliban, which mostly come from there, have a claim in the whole of uh, Afghanistan, but to that matter, even now to Central Asia and to the rest of the world in terms of their fundamentalist and extremist ideology. So after 50s, the idea of neutrality was too harsh for our nationalists to keep it as a policy because as a neutral, you should not interfere in the other country's internal affairs. And we used to do that in Pakistan. So to do that, we moved from this idea of neutrality to something softer because we thought that you know, neutrality was in a time, it was sort of a, you know, a, a fait accompli on us when the British were there and then the Tsarist Russia was in the North. And the, so now the British are not no more there. Why we need to be neutral? We can ally ourselves with our friends in the north with the Soviet Union, and then we can, you know, keep pushing for our claims. So that's why, you know, we moved out of neutrality or strict neutrality into something which is called non-aligned or non-alignment. And there, of course, non-alignment. We all knew that non-alignment was okay. Started with a very, you know, sort of independent third uh, force, but slowly it was embraced or it was, you know, uh, gobbled by the. Uh, uh, by the Soviet sort of, you know, uh, approaches. So if you look at the UN, uh, uh, United Nations uh, 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 records, so they worked together. And even in Afghanistan, when the Soviet Union uh, attacked Afghanistan and, 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 uh, and, and occupied it in 79, 79, uh, even NAM could not, uh, could not criticize or could not even, you know, uh, condemn the invasion. Because you know countries like Cuba and a few others they got together and you know they blocked anything in them. So I can give you some of these examples. So neutrality moved to become non-alignment, and slowly non-alignment uh, become you know took the, the power, the, the color change and became reddish and completely red. And in '79 we were a communist uh, satellite. And this is where the first part of Afghanistan neutrality aimed, and in my book. So I have quoted this argument that in 50 years, Afghanistan remained neutral. It was the era of tranquility and the era of balance of power or balance of interest, whatever you call it. Northern Afghanistan, the Russian and the Soviet were helping us. But in South of Afghanistan, it was, you know, the uh, the NATO bloc, the United States, and the other. So there was a sort of understanding between the North and the South and the economic projects and things like this. But when the, when, the, when the Soviet moved south of Kabul, this was when you know, the whole balance uh, tilted on their favor uh, and their invasion ended at Afghanistan's neutrality. And to that matter, the era of tranquility and the era of balance in Afghanistan. And since then, we are witnessing all these uh, wars in Afghanistan. Which means that you know, in during that era, the competition rivalry in Afghanistan was only economic and to some extent political because the world was competing in Vietnam and Southeast Asia and different other places. But when that chapter was closed, there I think open rivalry started in Afghanistan and today, like 2001, like 1996, like 1992, all these events, including 
14th of August this year, I could see it, you know, as a student of international relation and you know, geopolitical studies as continuation of that rivalry. With, of course, new players are introduced in the current one. China has never been part of the game. They are right now. Uh, Central Asia, of course, they are playing together with, uh, with the CSTO and to some extent Shanghai and Russia, but they are independent players themselves. Uh, even Turkmenistan being neutral, you can, there's another subject that you can perhaps discuss, what kind of neutrality Turkmenistan has. And then Iran is a prominent player, and, and, and that's how you know, things have changed. In the past, there were only two players. It was either Zoros Russia, British India, and later on it was either NATO versus Warsaw, but now it's a mess of many uh, international and regional players. Turkey has a role to play, Saudi Arabia, even Qatar, a small state like Qatar is playing. He, they have, a, a, you know, uh, fly in the Taliban leader in the Qatari Air Force to Kandahar. And yesterday, the biggest Qatari plane arrived in Kabul without having, you know, the air control system. So I think you could see that that is, the players are changing, but unfortunately for us, the battleground is still the same, which is Afghanistan. So what I did was during my research, so I looked at this, that is there any way that the return of some sort of neutrality will bring back a balance of power in Afghanistan where we could remove ourselves from this competition? That's, you know, as an idea, it's a very nice idea. And then as a diplomatic solution, that is what neutrality's job is. One of the functions of neutrality is to remove yourself or to remove a place when it is neutralized, like, you know, Austria and, and, and Laos, that to remove uh, that country from an open and contested, you know, militarily and hotly contested area of superpower rivalry. So you can you can declare it neutral. You can keep a balanced relationship economically with with, with all the you know great powers involved, uh, and and but then you know militarily and politically you announce yourself neutral and keep what you know an Indian uh, scholar said equidistance or equal proximity, depending on how you you define. So I started working on this. I was fascinated with this uh, in Australian National University, and it's also easier to do it, you know, as I was a diplomat too. Many other subjects were very difficult for me to access. Uh, so I started doing this. What I find out was, of course, there's a lot of talk about neutrality in Afghanistan, but there is very few material. Not only in Afghanistan, around the world. I think neutrality is a very understudied area. Even in the literature, it's so difficult to find you know, something new. But then I, I thought that, okay, you know, uh, let's, let's create of course, you know, you all experts and scholars for your PhD to be accepted, you have to have, you know, framework, you have to do all those you know, uh, analysis, uh, thanks to the English school, which is also Australian National University, you don't have to be like, you know, at state, I have to create all this, you know, quantitative analysis, which would have been impossible in terms of neutrality, because the numbers are so small, and there's very few data to do any regression analysis. Of course, I studied in the United States, I did my master's there, I did the development studies. So, so here uh, I did, you know, I, I look at all the literature which existed and I kind of did sort of case studies, comparative case studies of neutrality, what are, you know, the successful neutrals and what are the uh, uh, failed neutrals and then what defines success and, and failure on the basis of this very small um, uh, uh, group or a small uh, literature that I had uh, at my disposal. So I looked at Austria and Switzerland, Switzerland and Austria basically as you know, very uh, successful neutrals, of course, historically very different uh, in terms of the time difference. But again, one was neutralized, one was Austria, and then the other uh, gradually uh, became a neutral as an identity. Of course, you know, the, all the other stories, you know, they, we have, I'm, I'm sitting in Switzerland, I should not talk about neutrality of Switzerland, so you all perhaps know very well. And then I look at laws because in terms of the documentations, in terms of the diplomatic efforts, in terms of the, uh, uh, all those you know, uh, legal and, and international efforts, in the, uh, Switzerland was, uh, you know, uh, uh, Aust uh, Laos had a, a very structured uh, approach toward neutrality. Uh, 
uh, negotiations, agreements, regional guarantees, international guarantees, Khrushchev and Kennedy agreement and all of this. But then it was a failure. And to me, more than Austria or, or Switzerland, to me, Laos was a very important case to look into possibility of Afghanistan neutrality. Because there, it was not only the international players, the superpowers at the time, but also regional players. Maybe the Chinese agreed, or the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese agreed on some sort of neutrality of Laos, just as a matter of time before they can you know, uh, take over the whole place as soon as the Americans and the others are out. And they knew that you know, Russia, I mean, Soviet Union does not have a major role to play there. It was the, it was the region itself. So the same, the similar idea was in Afghanistan. Taliban's uh, approach was that, okay, fine, you know, in 2019 and 20, that you will be okay as, as soon as you leave, you will create an inclusive state, everything will be fine. But the minute they managed to get, you know, uh, an, a, a United States exit, and to that matter, Pakistan, and now, you know, the others. So it's, uh, you know, uh, tomorrow you will, you will witness uh, a very inclusive state by all the Taliban. So I think that is, that's basically what was also the case in, in, in Laos, just a matter of time. And then I, and, and I look into the failure and success. I, of course, like any other nice uh, students, I created an analytical framework on the basis of what are the elements of success, uh, domestic and international and, and, and uh, external. And I created an eight, uh, I, of course, from the literature, I find that at least to me, there are, there are six major elements uh, 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 that uh, or major factors which can contribute to neutral to success of neutrality. Uh, but then, but then when I uh, when I looked at uh, the case of Afghanistan, then I find out that that no, it's you know beyond uh, this. So to me, I just you know created this simple formula that these external. Um, factors plus internal factors will be equal to a sustainable a permanent neutrality. And in terms of the you know, uh, domestic uh, uh, factors, I say at some level of you know, uh, uh, domestic cohesion and stability, because of a country which is in turmoil and continuous instability, and there is no, you know, some level degree of cohesiveness among uh, that country, that nation, it's difficult for it to be neutral because you cannot be neutral while another community will have an irredentalist uh, view. And then I also uh, 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 outlined or highlighted that, that the country and the state should have some minimum level of uh, military and economic uh, uh, power. And to that, I mean that, that at least the state should be able to finance its core budget and to finance its own military, even small military from its own domestic resources for it to become, uh, to be you know, a candidate for a successful neutral. And then on the, on the international or, or the external side was that you know, the geopolitical position and importance of a country. Uh, outside balance of power and if there is you know, hot competition and still military still, because normally one of the definition of neutrality is that neutrality changes a military still made into a political state. And then an agreement, a consensus of major neighboring power on the neutralization or neutrality. So all the players should think that even if you don't get all our interest, our relative interest is that this place could be neutral. So it means that this neutral spaces geopolitically, they will be important, strategically important, but not strategically vital to one of the major powers. If a country, if a space is strategically vital to the security interest of one of the superpowers, uh, I think that power would do everything possible to secure it for itself or not to let it be neutral. And we have seen you know, cases like in Georgia and Ukraine and, and many other places when it become really strategically important for a major power, they will, they will try everything possible at least to secure their vested interest. Even if the rest is becoming neutral, then they have no problem. Like, you know, if you ask, ask the uh, Russian experts, they will tell you that even right now, if Georgia want to be neutral or Ukraine, they will be happy. And to that matter, uh, that was their also policy vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan for the past uh, 14 years. The official foreign policy of 
Russian foreign ministry was a neutral Afghanistan. Uh, so this was, this was in the literature. But what I, in terms of laws and, the, uh, and Afghanistan, I added to the literature, hopefully, I think this is my contribution to the literature and neutrality, is that uh, the countries wanted to be neutral, or any country wanted to be neutral, has to have agreed upon borders. So it means that the borders should be internationally recognized. And of course, it's not only mine, even in the case of uh, Austria, that was one of the impediments until they did not, you know, in, finish their, uh, these border issues with uh, former Yugoslavia and also with, uh, with, with Italy, the question of neutrality was, was still there. But in the case of Afghanistan, this is the same. And then what I find out also from uh, literature in, in, in Laos was that the uh, intervention, contribution, or, or, or engagement of non-state uh, military uh, actors. Because in the case of, in the case of uh, Laos, uh, yes, fine, maybe the Laotian government or the, uh, or the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese government agreed, but still they were in OPT law and they were like you know, the South Vietnamese militias that they could still, uh, uh, Viet Congs and the others, they could still use what they call this Ho Chi Minh trial uh, to move back and forth, but but you know no country was taking responsibility. They said yes, we signed into neutrality of laws, but these are non-state actors and we can't control them. So I think the the even right now, fast forward for many years in 1962 and three in Laos, do we know that the the, the presence of non-state actors in the Afghanistan and Pakistan border region? is very serious. These are not only non-state actors, which are like you know, nationalists and they are fighting on, on, on behalf of this. These are extremist Islamist non-state actors. Uh, and also, of course, now we have IS and the others. So this, these are the two other added elements into uh, question of neutral. And the last one, which again, I, I think that, that you know, maybe this is my contribution, was the ideological and cultural outlook toward a neutrality as an identity. So here, if you look at Switzerland right now, you talk to the Swiss, they will tell you now Swiss is running for UN Security Council, there's a debate here. That, but a number of referendums, uh, when people ask that, you know, why you want to be neutral, people don't really know that why they want. But they, knew, they think that, you know, this cross in the flag uh, of Switzerland and what Switzerland is defined, uh, is neutrality. So it means that, that it's part of the identity of Swiss. While if they need it or don't need it anymore, you know, practically, I think that became part of the identity. But in the case of Afghanistan, neutrality, if you take the, the word neutral and translate it into Farsi, or even to that matter in Pashto, and this I think Farsi and Pashto are similar, uh, it's it is it's very difficult to justify it because it has kind of a negative connotation. It's like, you know, uh, there's somebody who doesn't have manhood in the sense. So you're neutral, you are like you no know, genderless, basically, things like this. That's number one. Number two, which is again very important in the context of places like Afghanistan, is the element of religion, Islam. You see, the whole war in Afghanistan is fought in the name of religion. And even now, what the Taliban are trying to define their government is under the name of Islam. So I looked at the Islam literature, Islamic studies literature, that how uh, that uh, literature looks into the question of neutrality. Can an Islamic polity be neutral? Because you know, if you look at the classical versus the uh, the, the, the uh, uh, modern approach towards uh, Islam, or, or maybe even the from the time of the Prophet. There are divergent views because in one view, Islam is an ummah, it's all together. You know, you cannot be neutral because there is no question of nation state in it. Because you have to, if there is a problem like in Palestine, as a country, Afghanistan or, or, or Yemen or Bahrain or Nani, you cannot be neutral. There's no question of neutrality. It's you versus them. So that's, that's one way of to look at it. So if you look at this way, then the jihad is continuing up to the last day, and you know, there is this Ummah, there is this Khilafat, even who has created some sort of you know, nations, it's based on the tribes, it's based on you know, some sort of logic, which is not acceptable to many uh, people as jurisprudence. And, and I'm sure you know all of this, and that's the whole, the whole mentality of IS and the other. 
But then there is another part of you know the classical literature, uh, especially you know out of Egypt and Syria and the others, where they will say no, it's possible because even in Islam itself, in his Quran, there is, there are uh, references made that if the other side withdrew from the fight, you withdrew too. So withdrawal is an option. It's not only Dar al Harb, which is you know the uh, the adob of war or, or the adob of peace or you know the uh, which is you know in the in, in the pre-classical uh, uh, studies of Islam that either it's you know it's either disbelievers or believers but then there is a possibility of withdrawing if your enemies withdraw and then there have been a number of cases in the beginning of Islam like you know in the places like today's Sudan and in Ethiopia and a part of Yemen in the past where Prophet Muhammad even in you know in Cyprus that, that when the other side said, look, you know, I'm not going to fight with you, they also withdrew, said, look, leave these people, let them be whatever they are. And, and, and that's how somehow an attitude of Islam toward neutrality. So I took that, I said, like, it is possible uh, for you to, to be neutral uh, and to be an Islamic polity. Because that's another question that will the Taliban be neutral in, in the Kashmir issue? Will they be neutral in Xinjiang and you know, in the Ivors? Will they be neutral in che Chechen and the other issues in, around, uh, around the world? Because if they are then, because then they are made of the Islamic scholars, then they will be questioned that, okay, where is your justification? Because you are thinking of your, you know, your leader is the leader of the faithful. So faithful needs your help somewhere. And that was the basis of you know, the Afghanistan empire, when there were problems of Muslims in India, they used to call some of the rulers of Afghanistan and they went there and they do the pledging and all this stuff and then uh, they come back. So I think that is the, this, uh, this uh, analytical framework that I create. And then I studied Afghanistan and, uh, and I put it in this. So my conclusion was that Afghanistan had an instance of neutrality formal official, First World War, Second World War. It was a buffer state in the past, geopolitically. So in terms of this, uh, this analytical framework that I created, I think three or four of them, Afghanistan fits naturally to the profile of a, of, of a neutral state. Uh, but, then, but then there are many other elements that we need to work with the region and among ourselves as Afghans to, to make Afghanistan a neutral state. But at the end, my... Uh, observation and conclusion. Of course, I went through to do a little bit of study on, on Georgia and Ukraine, kind of, you know, a, a post <laughs> uh, um, after finishing my, my, my paper. But then I didn't publish that in this book because it was a limited uh, number of words for it to be published. And again, my conclusion there was that, that you know, Georgia and Ukraine also fit very much the profile of, of a neutral state if they wanted to regain their territorial integrity and, and whatever they have lost possibly. But that's a different thing. In case of Afghanistan, my conclusion was that, that not neutrality in the sense of like this very old uh, Cold War and, and pre-Cold War notion of neutrality, but a modern neutrality, you know, what, what you know, I think is uh, one of our authors here, I think it's, it's Heinz said that engage neutrality. Uh, kind of approach where you can be militarily, no, no military base in Afghanistan and politically you should not be, you know, ideologically connected to here or there, but then economically you need to be, you need to integrate Central Asia to South Asia to West Asia to China because Afghanistan has two, again, you know, economic uh, or geopolitical def definitions. It depends on how you look at it. One is a, a buffer space. One is an insulator in terms of what Barry Buzan, you know, as uh, regions and the powers uh, tell us. It was an insulator, insulating these three different regions uh, from each other. But the other is, the other approach, if you look at it from the sort of, you know, international economic approach, development is an aggregator, basically. It's a land bridge which can connect all these, you know, places, especially when you have these ideas of major transport infrastructures from Belt and Road or from Northeast corridors, from you know, Europe, Asia corridors, all of these corridors that you can see in the maps, you know, it, 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 have to, it has to cross from Afghanistan. And Afghanistan can you know, uh, become a land bridge around, around about instead of you know, a, a wall 
instead of a buffer, instead of a, an, an insulator. So, but in both ways, in, in, in for it to become a land bridge, it has to be a safe and secure bridge for everyone. It shouldn't be a bridge controlled by one country and then the other country will be worried that, you know, if I cross from that bridge, well, that bridge will blow or block me or things like that, like the Swiss Canal or things, like that. examples. So it's it has to be a neutral place where everybody could use, could get benefits from, but not really to try to, to monopolize. And, and so uh, the last point is that Afghanistan has now moved again into an era of regional competition where the West is out and the lost and the new player, I mean, they like it or not, is the era of China. China is entering Afghanistan if at, for their own sake wanted to control this vile group, which is called Taliban, because they have so far shown that they are not, they are not going to uh, fulfill their promises which they have made in the past two years. None of them have been fulfilled so far. You know, the Al-Qaeda and the others are on loose, Islamic State. And again, the possibility of a new insurgency, a resistance is building up in northern areas of Afghanistan as we speak, because Taliban would want to create tomorrow an exclusive Taliban government. So in future, either China will come in and spend a lot of energy and resources also to support Pakistan because the Afghanistan profile is bigger uh, uh, and, and, and more complicated than for Pakistan to single-handedly you know, manage it. So if China enters, then what will be China's input? How far? Because an state in Afghanistan cannot run without foreign subsidy, at least for a couple of years until you really dig the minerals. But on the other hand, if an state is not uh, pluralistic, diversified, and decentralized, uh, there are many other communities. Taliban could only represent a small piece of one community of Afghanistan. Taliban are not an inclusive group. So when they announce their government tomorrow and it's full of their own cadres, uh, certainly I think tomorrow will be the beginning of another struggle. And perhaps this time for a new identity in north of Kabul, you know, in different places of Afghanistan, when they do not see themselves uh, presented in a new system, so I think this, the, the jury is still out, but, but my conclusion is that you know, for, a, for an Afghanistan to be a united, sovereign, independent, and prosperous country, uh, there are two major overarching policies to be considered by anyone you know, at the helm of the power and for the region. One is uh, decentralization at the domestic level, Pakistan, for example, the same, you know, India is the same, many other countries, which has, any, for example, here in, uh, in Switzerland, and in its foreign policy, a neutral foreign policy. So Taliban will be successful if they can have a decentralized system of government, even a federal system of government, and a neutral foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the region, because they have an opportunity, they have control of almost 98% of the country at this stage, uh, but if they make a mistake of which we all of our rulers have made in the past uh, 130 years to try to think that they can centralize Afghanistan given the geography and, and pluralistic national identities, or they can think that they can edge one, one region or one superpower against the other, like we did in the past. Sometimes, you know, we work with the British against Russia, then we work with, you know, with Russia against the United States, and then with the United States against China. I think that that will be a mistake, which you know will haunt them from the from from the next day of their government. And I think with this, I will stop. I don't know. I said I will speak for thirty minutes. I don't know how long I we went on, because I'm very passionate about this, and I'm still expecting that I will be called maybe to 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 uh, to give advice on neutrality and 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 to give you also uh, something which is no more secret that the previous government president of Afghanistan, who unfortunately escaped. Uh, he asked me to give him a, uh, a paper, an analysis of possibility of neutrality of Afghanistan. I provided him. He, at the last days, last year, he was he was thinking seriously that in terms of the foreign policy, this is the way out. But I think he thought about it too late. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Andisha. That is a fascinating talk. And, you know, also for everybody in, in, in his book, Ambassador Andisha really um, correctly also describes this historical uh, continuity. You write it really beautifully how since 1873, there was always an up and down of neutrality in Afghanistan for different reasons and different kinds and at, at, different, at different stages. And the interesting thing that you also point out is the difference between imposed from the outside, but also at some point wished from the inside, First World War, Second World War, perfect examples in your diplomacy. And then also in these interwar periods, how sometimes there was just a national motivation, also depending on how much unity there was in foreign policy making. And um, as you are describing it today, a lot of uh, the future of Afghanistan is uh, still determined by outside by outside forces. And in this sense, I support your analysis also in the way of saying that um, a, a neutral Afghanistan will also depend on whether or not this neutrality can solve the security dilemma for the others around it. There needs to be an added value for everybody else to agree it's okay, it's better for us to foster indigenous neutrality, right? And keep them, uh, keep them out. Um, I would like to now invite also questions from, uh, from the floor. I already have two people who wrote me that they uh, ardently want to ask you questions. You're a Uh, in terms of the crisis of identity, you know, the uh, nation building project uh, along with the state building project in Afghanistan had, like many other countries, its ups and downs. And uh, um, we had a number of opportunities to create uh, a nation. Of course, it started with, uh, 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 with uh, post-independence, 1919. Uh, and the project which came with Mahmoud Tarzi from, uh, from, from the Ottoman Empire. And the idea was that, you know, even the whole name of Afghan and the new identity around Afghan, which, which can consume or can integrate the other small identities of, you know, Pashtun and within Pashtun, even at the time, the Muhammad Zais were a separate uh, uh, town. They calling themselves, if you look at Amun Khan's uh, Taskera, he said, from the Qawm Sharif of Muhammad Zayin. Okay, so it's these are these are the, the the whole idea of creating this state on the basis of even at that time it was on the basis of you know, Islam and some sort of pan-Afghan identity, which you can bring the symbols and the creed. But then the question came in that that what cultural heritage you need to build this state because. The state in Kabul from the time of uh, Tamar Shah, I will bore you know some of the others with this Afghanistan's history, but bear with me. Uh, so when the you know the founder of uh, Afghanistan Empire, Ahmad Shah Durrani, died, his son because of you know his problem with his cousins, so he has to leave Kandahar because they would every time attempt him on his life. So he came to Kabul somewhere, you know, secluded. Kabul was kind of a bastion, and he brought a number of people with him. But the Kabul was traditionally not you know Pashtun. Uh, city, it was a city of you know, travelers and you know, many other people. But in Kabul, the whole court, the whole system was Persianized, including you know, he himself, including his children, including Shah Shuja and the others. And then at that time, of course, this question of identity was not very, very significant. But then after the First World War, when Iran moved from being a Persian empire into Iran, you know, taking the identity of Persians, courts, Turks, everything else, then Afghanistan was faced like, okay, you know, if Iran is, is, is uh, uh, basically monopolizing this cultural heritage of this land of Khorasan, which includes Central Asia, then we have to do something else to distinguish ourselves from Iran. And this was when there was an attempt to, to build on into this, you know, uh, uh, Afghan language. The Afghan language for that, if you look at Saraj al Akbar and the others, the first newspaper, they equated with the Pashtun. And I think this was very mild at the beginning because it was like, you know, you can take some books like Buskashi from the others, Maulana Jalaluddin Balkhi, and then, you know, the airline called Bakhtar. And, but then slowly the hotliners intruded this and 
because the government of uh, Nader Khan let out owed a lot to the hotline, you know, uh, tribes from now from the Haqqani region. So they have to change money. And this was when the whole question came in in the nation state bill. I will leave that there. And then every time we move to ideology, ideological you know, positions, then this identity came as a strong uh, uh, element. And especially when, uh, when we were keep pushing for you know, Pashtun unification or Pashtunistan, then slowly the other communities in Afghanistan, they thought like, you know, why we should do that when we have our own problem? So I think that was in terms of the nation. And that also had its impact on the, on the state. So this keep continuing. And that's why if you look at it, that what is now the glue that every insurgent in Afghanistan is using is not the question of Afghan, it's the question of Islam. And that's how, you know, uh, uh, a Chinese Muslim or maybe a Central Asian or a Chechen or Arab can come and feel very safe within the ranks of, of this Mujahideen and the Taliban because that's a different question. How we can separate it, then I think it will take time. Identity, so you say that question of division. You see, unfortunately, I'm still you know, uh, very much believing that, that if, if we can go for decentralization and for neutrality, we can have a, as I say, the sovereign, independent, and prosperous Afghanistan. But but if you look at the the way that that the government fought, it created a very clear fat, uh, ethnic fault lines. For example, the way that the governor of Ningahar, who was the chief electoral officer of Afghanistan, and to put the fate of Afghanistan in the hands of President Ashraf Ghani, was very nicely smiling and sitting with an Afghan because for him. It makes maybe a little bit of difference, but not much. But for that person sitting with him was Masood San or maybe Dostum San or somebody else, that would have been very difficult. And even that was one of the uh, uh, complaints or blames against President Karzai, that he received the presidency from President Rabani and actually Dr. Abdullah was the mediator. But when he finished, he was not willing to hand it back through an election to somebody like Abdullah who is, you know, a, a mix. So I think this, unfortunately, with the Taliban tomorrow, hopefully they are not going to be too crazy, announcing a Taliban stand, I think you will see that sign of, you know, uh, divisions and fusion becoming more and more obvious. Because like, for example, Amrullah Saleh put all his eggs as a vice president of Afghanistan in the basket of President Ghani and defending, you know, every time he said for me, well, Ashan is not important to defend, but Helmand is important. But he failed. And in the last minute, he find out that there was a plot to hand them over to Khalil Atan. And he escaped. So I think that is there. Will it go for a divided country? I don't know. But if there is a Kurdish model or a federal system, I think that's something in making if the system is not going to be inclusive in that sense. Your number two question was about Pakistan that all of this is happening in Pakistan. Yes, you all know, and the world know it. Bin Laden was not uh, apprehended from Afghanistan. Everybody know, like, you know, the, the sun is coming, you know, in the, in the morning, that, that the Quetta Shura, the Haqqani Shura, and all of them just, they drove in. Yes, Mr. Brother, he came in with a Qatari plane, or US plane, but then, of course, he went to consultation there. And Haibatullah came to Kandahar through his film. But why not? I think this is one major mistakes of very, I don't call them naive because they are more experienced than me, but, but you know, when you get to politics, you will become uh, maybe too emotional. Our emotional leaders from Daoud Khan onward, every time a foreign power became their friend, they think that because they are friend and they say something good to us, they will go and they will take those lands for us and they will destroy Pakistan. Nobody will do this. Maybe Khrushchev once in 1955 was drunk sometime and he said, I'm going to burn Shah. But later on, you know, when he was okay, he said like, in hell, why should I do this? Same Bush. Bush said that, you know, I'll send Pakistan to the Stone Age. But later on, they find out, no. But why? My question, again, it could be looked into the literature, which I mentioned at the beginning. Afghanistan is strategically significant, but not vital. Pakistan is strategically vital both for China and for United States. That's why the, the threshold of tolerance is very high. And that gives Pakistan the nuclear umbrella 
gave Pakistan, you know, a latitude to do whatever it wants under that, you know, threshold. So that's what it is. Pakistan could become anything, but nobody in the world, including in the UK, UK is very clear about it, that, you know, the army of Pakistan is the only uh, savior of that country or the nuclear weapon or whatever falling in the hands of terrorists. So we can, uh, we can tolerate basically whatever they can do, except if they wanted to give them nuclear power. If they want to keep them close to nuclear power, Bin Laden close to their military installation, we can still tolerate that, but we don't want to go against it. So that's the question. They are strategically vital and we should understand. The problem is the Uran line. Unfortunately, I was thinking to some extent when I was doing this research that to put this forward, because I went to Pakistan and I met a number of ex people, ex everything for my research. And I asked, put this question that, you know, in my analysis, one is the border. If we, you know, uh, presumably, or, you know, uh, just for the sake of question, if we accept this Euron line, will you accept a neutral Afghanistan? The answer was, it depends. So what does it mean? It means that with these uh, pan-Islamist groups, which they have, and of course, if you look at the definition of Pakistan, one thing that defines Pakistan is religion. And, and they cannot you know, separate themselves, uh, separate jihad from the motto of their army. So that is, that is very difficult uh, to go against any Islamist group because any Islamist group, extremist Islamist group is uh, an extension of their army. Uh, the same way that you know, uh, Mike Mullen, uh, the Joint Chief of the U.S. Army said that you know this is a veritable. He said the Haqqani group is the veritable hands of ISIS. I think that is that is clear, and that's not because they like it or not. This is how that that country is defined. I mean, if we kill ourselves, it's a different thing. But this is how it's defined. So for them, the Iran line is a nuisance. If they recognize it, then people will say, "Oh, you know, you cross international border. Why not?" You know, uh, Amacho Masood later, Amacho Masood once there was an interview with him that, "What do you think of the Iran line?" and because it was 1993, and it was the people taught us 100 years. And was, where is it and how? He said it used to be in, uh, you know, in Sindh and Abbasin, and then it came to where it is right now. During our time, it was in the borders of the Kabul, and now it's it's in, in Matak. He said there's not in Khatak and Matak. Matak is a place in, in Charikar. He said maybe after some time, it will be in Omu River. So for them, I think the line is a shifting area, and, and it's it's good not to be internationally sanctioned or recognized because that will give them, you know, uh, a total control to move in and out. But when they want, they can close it down. If there is a strong government, if there is, you know, a, a national authority who can trade this with some sort of access to the sea, which is number of, uh, this was also one of the ideas that we were thinking because, you know, in question of Peru, Peru and Ecuador, I don't know, Peru or Chile, I just forgot that there is a case where something like this happened. They traded, you know, one port of border to an access to sea or things like this. Even in Africa and many places that happened. I think that could be a solution in the long term, but it became a taboo where, you know, the more it's uh, undetermined, it's not the Afghans who will gain, but it's the Pakistanis. Thank you, it was very, because it comes from Afghans. I know we Afghans, we <laughs> like to touch historical points too much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a, a very good answer with um, a lot of content. And I will now ask uh, Heinz Gertner, whom you already mentioned, uh, to give us his comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal, for organizing this series on uh, neutrality. As the ambassador mentioned, uh, neutrality is, in fact, an uh, under-researched uh, uh, topic in the academic uh, world. Uh, it's unfortunate that that's not statistically quantitative data enough that you can do a quantitative uh, analysis. But uh, I think uh, the ambassador made a very uh, valid, uh, valuable, uh, qualitative contribution uh, to uh, your debate, to uh, uh, our debate. Um, and listening to you, uh, your illuminating, very illuminating talk, uh, Mr. Ambassador, listening to you and looking at the history of uh, Afghanistan, uh, of course, it's full of foreign intervention, uh, occupation, uh, uh, interference, 
So I'm asking you and I'm asking myself whether is there an, any uh, other reasonable uh, alternative to Afghanistan uh, as, uh, uh, than, than neutrality. Uh, so I can't, uh, the counterfactual question to you would be, uh, what would be the uh, alternative? What would be alternative to neutrality for uh, Afghanistan? And if you take the main uh, features of uh, the de definition of neutrality, uh, no uh, deployment of uh, foreign uh, uh, troops, uh, no participation in military uh, alliances, and no, participate, not, no participation in foreign wars. So that would be su sufficient to keep, to wall off uh, foreign interference and uh, uh, influence if it uh, is, uh, is respected. It's not necessary that you have a neutrality when it comes to uh, values. Uh, so Austria, for example, adopted Western values immediately after it became uh, uh, neutral. So that refers to what you, your example of Islam. So that's not necessary that uh, Afghanistan would be neutral towards Islam, for, for, uh, for example. Uh, but also neutrality doesn't mean to be neutral towards uh, uh, economic issues or even security issues. You can't be neutral towards terrorism. Uh, and, but you can in, engage in international organization, even uh, European uh, security, uh, regional arrangements. That's what engaged neutrality basically uh, 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 means. So uh, this type of neutrality would be uh, basically the, my guess is the only uh, reasonable alternative for Afghanistan uh, also under a, a new government, under a, a Taliban uh, uh, government. Uh, and let me finish with one a paradoxical uh, 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 example. So there are many examples in, uh, you know this better than every, and anybody else, uh, examples in Afghan uh, history, uh, which would uh, uh, confirm basically the uh, value of uh, Afghan uh, neutrality. But the one paradoxical example would be after the uh, invasion of the Soviet Union, uh, 79, uh, Jimmy Carter, president of the US at that time, uh, said he would suggest uh, a neutral uh, Afghanistan. Of course, at that time, everybody said that's a non-starter. The Soviets are there, the troops are there. But he, he is talking about, that's only this American geopolitical uh, interest they're talking about. Neutrality. Looking back from today, this would, be, would have been the best option for Afghanistan at that time. It would have been better for the Soviets, it would have been better for the uh, Americans uh, later on, it would have been better for, for the Afghans. So, and I guess we, ha we are in the same situation right now, there's no invasion uh, 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 at, at, the, at the moment, uh, uh, but still foreign influence, attempts of foreign influence are there. So there so are many talking about now vacuum. Here is a vacuum. The Americans go and we have a vacuum. So, so the Russians are waiting, the Chinese are waiting, the Pakistani are waiting. So they're all waiting. If you talk about vacuum, it's not that you invite another superpower, that you be, have a recognized uh, neutrality to avoid uh, this type of uh, vacuum everybody is talking about. Thank you. Sorry for being so long. You see, I'm passionate as well. <laughs> you all are, so please, Ambassador. Thank you very much. I think it's um, you know, uh, it's honor to have uh, Professor Hens here. I, as I said, you know, I read a uh, number of his books and articles, and he is, is a pioneer there. Uh, um, so I don't want to say anything more on that. But one thing, one observation about what you said about uh, President Jimmy Carter, and I mentioned this in my um, in, in the book, is that. But unfortunately, for neutrality or for the neutral places, the proposal for neutralization of at least place like Afghanistan comes when the main influencer, the influence is waning. You see, when a country is at the top of its power, they don't think of neutrality as a solution. Like for example, the Russians were thinking of neutrality as a solution 
the Soviet Union in around 1985-1986 when they were about to leave. Okay. But when in 1979, when uh, also Lord Carrington, there is a record that he wanted to go to Security Council, but he failed to propose an Austrian uh, uh, or Finland, well, it was a Finland uh, Finlandization, basically they called it, that Soviet will have some uh, you know, influence, but not, not a lot. But at that time, neither the communist regime in Kabul nor the Soviet Union did not accept it because they were in, you know, in, the, in the height of their power. The same for United States. You know, when the United States came in 2002 or three or four or five, Russia was always asking, we want a neutral advance. Nobody was listening. But in 2012 and 13, when you know there were discussions with Secretary Hillary Clinton that you want a neutral Afghanistan, the other will say, no, I think it's too late. Now you are you don't have influence and you're losing your influence. So I think for neutrality to happen, like many other things, it has to be at the height of, uh, of power. Uh, but in terms of the alternative, you are right. I agree with you, and maybe because <laughs> we, we we believe in the same line of uh, 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 neutrality that Afghanistan does not have a alternative, a better alternative. It can continue like this, this cycle of violence and you know, this vicious cycle. Uh, there is no alternative for Afghanistan in its current geographical and state solution, which is a unified country, multi. But if Afghanistan, God forbid, is going to be divided into a Talibanistan and the north of Afghanistan, which have a different values, cultural approaches, more towards Central Asia. Then, of course, the question of neutrality will be out because this piece has to integrate with the Central Asia in terms of its economy and everything else. And they don't need to be neutral. And then, you know, the, the Talibanistan is Talibanistan. I don't know if they want it to be neutral or not. Then, of course, it will become really in the end of Pakistan. So I think that is uh, uh, either a neutral Afghanistan or unfortunately a divide. So that's that's not a very good uh, prospect. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Then the next question I have is from uh, Herbert Regenbogen in the Washington. Herbert, you please unmute yourself. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, my uh, field of interest lies between the political culture and the state of uh, peace uh, that Afghanistan will strive to achieve after 20 years of war. In this context, there arises the issue as uh, Afghanistan is a theocratic state if it should be one where religion and international relations are imbued, unlike the secular world of the West. Or other question would be that neutrality is a neutralization. Neutrality, as you're portraying, is an issue of identity. And neutralization means that authoritarian form of government can continue. Unlike Turkmenistan, will Afghanistan strive to achieve a pluralistic governance where the role of the woman, and especially where corruption, which is the unfolding issue here for the downfall of Afghanistan, which has not been mentioned. It is the pillar of governance that is really being the future question of can neutrality enhance this form of uh, rule of law, containment of, of intolerance? Can it bind a national identity which is supported by an economic system within the framework of other earlier empires like the Ottoman Empire, or what they refer to in Turkey today as the Neo-Ottoman Neo Empire expansion, just to leave that as models. So within those 
different pillars of security and securitization, which should not be replacing the very cardinal importance for civil society in an English school of thought of international relations, that these are very important handling of corruption, governance, tolerance, and prosperity to be anchored within a larger framework of political cultural dynamics. And if not the Ottoman, or rather in this case, Turkey, would be the pivotal counterbalance to a China which is handling or mishandling its Uyghurs, where the Russians think of the Muslims of Chechenia, and where there is so much discrimination against Muslims in the entire Central Asia and neighboring countries, that this would be really the starting point for a neutrality and, an, and a social, economic, political transformation. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, thank, thank you very much, Herbert. I think you, you, you pointed to a very uh, important uh, issue here, which I'm sure many will focus on, that is the political culture, and in this case, the sort of a counterculture, because so far in the past 20 years, the project that we worked and aligned ourselves with was the project of liberalization and democratization of Afghanistan. Uh, because Afghanistan in the past had some kind of new flirtation with democracy in the 1950s and the 60s, but after that, it was always authoritarian regimes of left and right. So uh, I don't why kind of you know, wash completely this, this uh, the constituency of, of democracy in Afghanistan. There's a huge one, and they have seen the individual liberties and things like this. But then how strong this, you know, theoretical, what do you call it, the theocratic state, theocratic state or theocratic uh, uh, regime could really uh, sustain itself and survive. You know, as an Afghan who is a practicing Muslim, I, th I think that, that Islam is a very significant, perhaps the most significant uh, element or tool for mobilization against something else, against you know, a foreign invasion, against a government, against whatever you don't like. Until you come to a stop, until you come to a stage where you need to govern. Because this is where that question of theocracy will end. Why? Because in, if you go in the model of theocracy, there are two issues. One is, of course, the world. Afghanistan is not Saudi Arabia. It doesn't have all this oil to you know, run whatever kind of government they want and the world could tolerate. That's number one, because there is, you know, I'm sitting here in Geneva and we have the Human Rights Council, which you know, after some time will start in two weeks, and the hell will break loose on, on, all, lose on, on all those violations of human rights. This world is living on the basis of a number of values. I think theocracy have brought Taliban or the others, even the Mujahideen, up to this level. And then the problem in Afghanistan is more to do with ideology than to national in terms of the nations or ethnic they call it i call it nation nations i think ethnic is very small a definition for like you know the nations of scotland and ireland and things like this so there are different nations there nations which has their co-ethnics or co-nations across the rivers like for afghanistan we have tajiks around 10 million in afghanistan and then there's a country called tajikistan which has 6 million there we have uzbeks we have Turkmen's, and pashtuns same so there are different nations come together in a piece of land. So when you come to the, to the stage of governance, which is on tomorrow for Taliban, yes, a theocracy might work, but it's not Iran. Why? Because here it is not a majority Shia place or one language, one religion. I know there are huge minorities in Iran, but then they have surpassed the, the ethnic identity of Kurds and the Turks and the others on the basis of a a Shia sect of Islam and the Persian as a language and also the cultural base, which, you know, the heritage of, of Persia empire. So the minute Taliban starts, which 
tomorrow that's the indication is that the five or eight most significant positions will go to one ethnic group. And this is when the question of Islam will be skipped aside and then there will be a definition of, okay, I work with you as a Taliban, but I'm not from the community that you, it was your base. So what about the rest of the Africans? I think theocracy will come into a fork when it hits the ethnic identity. That's something that we have to wait and see. On your question of, of neutrality versus neutralization, yes, I think neutralization has to be sort of you know, imposed from outside, neutrality has to come from inside. But, but you also mentioned this question of viability of a state. So I put you know, the assumptions in a way from the sort of, you know, from the prism of geopolitical, which always we see Afghanistan. So if you think that it's the primacy of external actors, grievances and interests, which inhibits state building in Afghanistan. If you look at it from that perspective, if you look at it that it's all about the foreigners, the foreign actors balance of interest in Afghanistan, which impacts the state building, then I think neutrality surpasses this idea of you know, corruption, economic and those things. Because when I was in the United States and when I discussed this, you know, my research with a number of people, including, you know, Henry Kissinger and Carl Anderford and a few others, they always told me, at least from their perspective, that the problems in Afghanistan, especially interventions and wars, major wars, it's not about the Afghans themselves. It's about when a, an international major power feels threatened by presence of the other one or by the you know, prominent predominance of the other play. This uh, first uh, Anglo-Afghan war started because uh, you know, even not an official, an unofficial envoy, embassy of Tsarist Russia arrived in Kabul without consent of British. So uh, you see, and then the, the Russian invasion, you know, one way of looking into it is that they were worried that perhaps, you know, the, the President of Afghanistan was getting too closer to the United States or to you know to the Western allies or you know, the changes which is happening in, in Iran might impact Afghanistan too. So I think this is always that and, and even if you look at the question of bin Laden, it was not about the Afghans being under you know the yoke of the Taliban, uh, uh, very you know preemptive policies and, and the women's rights. It was when you know the United States was attacked and then it was connected to Afghanistan that then they came. So the question is that if you look at it from that prism of primacy of external uh, grievances, external interests, external threat, whatever you call it, then I think neutrality has to be first for the Afghans to be enabled to create a state. But if you look at it from the other point of view of you know, political culture, you know, the, the, the question of stability, the question of cohesiveness of people together, so they create a state and then they declare it neutral. I think there's two ways looking at it, but for me, I look at it from the second one because this is what I have studied uh, uh, Afghanistan's issues, and that is that it's actually the external, is the balance of outside, which either make Afghanistan a sustainable place or not. Imagine if the United States wanted to keep these 2,500 troops, today we would not have to. I can tell you for sure. Maybe in four or five years, but not in this way, maybe in a, in a, in a more you know, manageable way, in a more sort of integrated way, they would have accepted some posts, some rule of Islamic Sharia, but not all. But now, when the United States washes its hands, Taliban come in. And now, even in this group, you're talking of all the Taliban government, which was not even the idea one month back. One month back, we will say that, you know, we take some ideas of Taliban into a system where, because there is a republic. So I think that is, that's, that's the way that, uh, that, that, that I look at it. Thank you. Maybe I take the opportunity to add here um, one thought or and a question as well about the inside or outside of this neutralization question. There's... Do you think that even among this very diverse group of the Taliban, there is enough people who understand this dynamic? Because one thing is that in Mongo Mongolian policy, polit uh, politics agrees on little else but the importance mm -hmm. of uh, neutrality and a third neighbor policy, because it's so clear, the writing is so clear on the wall. Do you think that in, in, inside the group of, of Taliban, you have similar, uh, similar things, that, uh, ideas that could happen, or is this just, 
is this might this not be the case? Thank you very much. I think uh, in terms of uh, neutrality movements, um, again, unfortunately, when people, uh, politicians are not in power or they're going out of power, they suddenly become, you know, uh, uh, neutrality advocates. Uh, in, in 2011 and 12, there was actually, I don't call it a movement, but there was a group of very prominent politicians uh, gathered together with, uh, with by the, you know, Frederick Herbert Stafting in Kabul, you know, German uh, organization. And they, you know, very senior, and then some of them came prominently in the next government, 2014. They advocated for neutrality. 2011, 12, there is a whole declaration actually came out by them. Uh, coming to Taliban, I think the, the idea of Taliban, their approach to neutrality is, uh, like Professor Herbert mentioned, is a sort of isolationist neutrality, a kind of Turkmenistan kind of neutrality where you can, you can hide yourself under the guise of neutrality to, uh, to do domestically whatever you want. So I think they, they have this uh, idea. They knew I've been, you know, in 2018, 2017, I, you know, we met some Taliban who live in Europe, okay? Their idea was that they told me that, oh no, we like your research, you like your analysis, you know, neutrality is important for Afghanistan, we should not get along with our neighbors. But also neutrality has to be a policy which should prevent interference in our affairs. And by interference, they mean like, you know, UN and the human rights and things like this. People should not tell us that, you know, how to, to, uh, to behave, you know, vis-a-vis -vis women and things like this. Uh, but, but, but of course there is, you know, it was probably amenable uh, to this, uh, uh, but that's the next stage. And on that stage, they should be able to rein in uh, the other uh, extremist forces of, of the other countries, which are with them. Because if you make the question of neutrality, then you have to kick those people out, give them to their countries. If there is Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, you have to hand them down and give them, say, we are neutral, take this. But, but then, because within the Taliban, they also have the two idea, ideas. Some of them are, of course, very seriously, they believe in that fraternity question. So that was the reason that they could not give up Bin Laden. So we have to wait and see, and that's why, you know, I intentionally studied the Islam, uh, Islamic aspect of neutrality. So when a question comes with, you know, I was not expecting government of Taliban, but the government with the Taliban together, so that's something which is an open question, uh, but there is a constituency now uh, about neutrality in Afghanistan. It's a, it's not a grassroots movement, but it's mostly a political movement. Okay. Um, you see, I think the first is um, the fundamental extremist Islamist constituencies will lose because then you will enter into you know, an idea that, uh, that, that this country is neutral. Um, and by neutral, it means that you know, they, will, they will make their own decisions uh, on, on the politics on the basis of you know, uh, uh, national interest, or they will not get involved in, in issues which are behind uh, the borders. Number one. Number two, I think it's for, for Pakistani, again, deep state for, you know, for the, the security apparatus. Uh, having having a Kabul ruled Taliban, uh, Kabul you know, ruled by Taliban or, or, or Taliban ruled Afghanistan, is always a strategic uh, interest. And, and if, he, if they agree on a neutral Afghanistan, I mean, they just easily they're going to lose it. So why should they accept a neutral Afghanistan when an allied Afghanistan uh, will be very helpful for them as a strategic debt vis-a-vis -vis, uh, India? So I think this is the two, the two group. But for Central Asia, I think a neutral Afghanistan will be very important for Iran, neutral to some extent also for Russia and, and for the United States, because even the United States, if they think that at least neutrality can, uh, can somehow you know, uh, create an obligation for the Taliban to remove the remnants of Al-Qaeda and IS and not to be involved in, you know, in this regional things, X versus Y and things like this, then, then of course, you know, policy of neutrality can at least, they can at least neutralize uh, this place and there will be an international commitment to, uh, to do this. 
uh, but certainly they are all winners and the losers and, and, and the one who will be the loser right now has more influence. Oh, okay, so with this piece of analysis, I would think we, could, we should close the session. It is 2.30 now. And again, I would like to...